right. Well, thank you, Mike. So we continue on our journey through the seven churches in the book of Revelation. And uh, you'll remember that it is the re revelation of Jesus Christ. So I hope uh, through all of this you are, you are gaining a better picture of who Jesus Christ is and how he operates among the church. Because that's what he wants us to know. That's what he wants us to discover. That uh, he is operating among the church. He was then. He was in the interim. He is now. And he will be as long as the church remains here on earth. So today we come to Pergamum, the third city in our journey. And uh, Pergamum was uh, uh, an interesting place uh, in a sordid sort of way. It is probably the most licentious of all the cities uh, that we will visit. Uh, you remember we talked about Ephesus and they had the, the temple of Diana and, and Artemis there and, and worshipped her and, and that was a big deal. And at this point in, in history, Ephesus was the main center, but it wasn't always so. Uh, originally, Pergamum uh, was uh, the capital of the Roman province of Asia, and uh, Caesar Augustus moved it to Ephesus. Now, what happened in Pergamum was, instead of having one main god like they did in Ephesus that they worshipped, Pergamum had many. And one of the things that was going on at that uh, point in history was something they called emperor worship. And the emperor was worshipped as a god. And uh, so uh, they had a, a temple there uh, to Augustus where you could go and worship him. They had a temple to the goddess Roma who is obviously the god of Rome. They had the, the temple to Zeus, who was also a very popular deity that they would worship. There was a temple to uh, Syphilis. Uh, you may or may not have heard of, of uh, that particular god, but he was the god of the physicians and uh, represented by a snake. And uh, several of the guilds had gods. If, if you were a member of a guild in those days, a guild would be similar to a, a trade union today. Uh, if you were in the, the masonry guild or the carpenters guild or the printers guild or whatever it was, you had your own little god. And so they all had temples there and they were continually sacrificing to these gods 24 hours a day. The priest would work shifts, and this thing was going on uh, continually. Now, that doesn't sound like a real good environment for a Christian to live in, does it? I mean, if you were in Pergamum, you didn't wake up in the morning thinking, ah, oh, this is going to be another glorious day with no opposition to the gospel. No. You woke up and you thought, my goodness, I wish I had enough money to move to Montana. <laughs> or Colorado Springs, or wherever I could be surrounded by like-minded Christians and not have to deal with all of these heathens. So the question is, this is the environment the church found itself in. Now, and I need to say a word because uh, we're so, so short-sighted in our history sometimes. We look at a place like Portland, Seattle, San Francisco, wherever you want to choose, uh, some of the more liberal cities uh, that tolerate some of the, the, the things that we really do not like and God does not like, and we say how terrible society has gotten. Well, society has gotten worse if we look back a hundred years. But if you look back hundreds of years and thousands of years, they were a lot more licentious and debauched in the first century than they are now. The, the, the society that first century Christians had to deal with and had to live amongst was much worse than what we deal with. We just have a tiny taste of it. I mean, think about it. What if downtown here in Camas we had 24-hour sacrifices going on and those things are always accompanied by ritual prostitution that went along with it uh, and we had to live amongst that and raise our kids in that environment. So we don't have it so tough after all. Now, I'm not saying we've got it easy. I'm not saying it's good. But historically speaking, we don't have it nearly as bad as those guys did. And yet they made it. They not only made it, not only did the church survive, but the church thrived, didn't it? Yeah. And so uh, we can do it too if we keep our eye on Christ and stay the course. So here's the question. How should the church conduct itself in this kind of environment? 
should, uh, should we withdraw or should we engage? Withdrawal or engagement? Or should we assimilate? I think we'll see here as we go along. Should we condemn or should we be tolerant? This is a very contemporary question. Pergamum is a very contemporary situation. Well, all of these churches are. Because, you know, there's one thing that never changes over time, and that's human beings. The human condition is always the same. So whether we're talking about 2,000 years ago, 6,000 years ago, or yesterday, or tomorrow, the one thing we can be sure of, the human condition is the same. D.A. Carson has written a book called, uh, I believe it's Carson who wrote it, it's called The Intolerance of Tolerance. And it is, it's, it's a great book. And uh, I heard him uh, share a message on that. And, you know, the, the, the God that society bows down to now uh, currently is the God of what? Tolerance. We have to be tolerant, don't we? We have to accommodate other people. We have to uh, make sure that we don't do anything to offend anyone and meet all of their needs. But the problem is, there is no one more intolerant than those tolerant people when it comes to Christianity. See? The most tolerant are the most intolerant of Christianity. Now, since the human condition is the same, guess what? It wasn't any different in Pergamum. If you went downtown and started witnessing to the ritual prostitutes, to the priests, to the people, uh, then they would eat the meat after it was sacrificed to the idols. That was part of the whole deal, you know. Uh, you weren't met with open arms. You were probably called that unthinkable word intolerant, judgmental, narrow-minded, what do you mean there is only one true God? What about Augustus? What about Zeus? What about Artemis? What about on and on it goes? How can you be so intolerant? In fact, one of the charges that was raised against Christians in the first century was that they were atheists because they didn't believe in all of the gods. Now, in this situation... In this circumstance, Jesus reveals himself to the church at Pergamum. Now, you remember at Ephesus, he revealed himself as the one who walks among the churches and has it all in his hand, right? And in Smyrna, he revealed himself as the one who died and came to life. Because that's what they needed at Smyrna. At Smyrna. They were facing death, and they needed to know that that wasn't the end. Now... Here at Pergamum, he says to the angel of the church in Pergamum, write the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. Now he is the one who has this sharp two-edged sword. And notice, notice the wording. It's, it's very specific. It doesn't say who has a sharp two-edged sword. He has the sharp two-edged sword. This sword is unique. It's one of a kind. It's not just any sword. Now, where do we hear about the two-edged sword? Bible scholars? Hebrews, chapter 4, right? Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of what? The heart. And isn't this one of the things we've been learning about Jesus? That he looks on the heart, on the inside. He doesn't look at the outside as we do. Now, if Jesus shows up and he says to you, I am here as the one who wields this sharp two-edged sword that cuts through all of your baloney, all of your facade, all of this thing you put up, how is that going to make you feel? Well, if you're in right relationship with him, you're going to say, oh, how comforting. 
God's Word. God knows my heart. He knows I love Him. He knows I'm in sync here. He knows, he knows that I'm, I'm, I'm into His Word. I'm, I'm reading about it. I, I spend some time at the church. I spend some time with God's people. I'm just, it's how comforting to know that this God, by the way, the sword is also a symbol of power. In the Roman Empire, it was a symbol of power. This one that has all this power and knows my heart, knows that my heart's right. This is wonderful. However, if our heart isn't right, we can fool everybody else. We can fool the people sitting in the church. We can fool the elders, the preacher. We may even fool our spouse. But he knows. And then, instead of comfort, it's going to strike fear into our hearts. And God knows, Jesus knows, that in the church in Pergamum, there are both groups of people. And so he says to them, I am the one who has the sharp, two-edged sword. To the one who is in right relationship with God, this will bring comfort. Uh, Psalm 129, uh, 23, Search me, o, o God, and know my heart. Try me, and know my thoughts. Can you say that? That's the test right there. Are, is your condition before Jesus Christ today such that you could invite him to examine your heart? To know your thoughts and your intentions? I hope so. I hope so. But on the other hand, we read about this sword in Revelation 19, verse 15. And here's what we find. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. That's the other side of it. You see, there's God's love, God's mercy, God's grace, but there's also God's justice. In the church of Pergamum, there was also a third group, though, and I call them the dabblers, or the double-minded ones. That's what James calls them in his book. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And they are the tolerant ones. And they are the Christians who say, well, we just need to accept everybody's lifestyle. It's okay. We just need to be loving. And we do. Okay? But there's a point that we don't go beyond, you see. And in Pergamum, there was a group within the church that had begun to tolerate the Christians acting like the non-Christians. And that's not good. And that's Jesus' main complaint against this church here at Pergamum. And we'll see that here in a minute. This is why God tells us, preach the word. See? And when, when Paul wrote to Timothy, he says, preach the word in season and out of season. In other words, whether the folks like it or don't like it, preach the word. I'm not supposed to be a sociologist. I, I'm not supposed to be a psychologist. Though it's good to know those things. I know a little bit about them. But my charge from God is to preach his word. See? And that never goes out of season. That's why Jesus said that he wants folks to worship him in spirit and in truth. He wants us to be spiritually engaged. He wants us to be emotionally involved with him. But he wants us to do it truthfully. He wants us to do it according to his word. He doesn't, we don't need to be weird. We need to be doing things according to his word. So Jesus has something to say to this church. And here it is in verse 13. I know where you dwell. Let's just stop there for a minute. Now to all the other churches, as we continue through, he's going to say to them, I know your what? Works. Or your deeds. Okay? He knows their works. He knows their deeds. To all the others... But to this one, he says, I know where you live. Okay? Where Satan's throne is. 
Yet you hold fast my name, you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you, here it is again, where Satan lives. He's saying to them, I know your struggle. I know your specific needs. I know you are living in a debauched society. I know you are living right in the middle of Satan's home territory where all this idol worship's going on, all this ritual prostitution's going on, all this terrible stuff is going on where people defame my name, they don't like Christians, they don't like you, they don't like me. I know where you live. What's the point of that? He's saying to them, just as he says to us, I know your situation. You know, sometimes we get in situations and we wonder, well, God, I wonder if God even understands. I'm, I'm, I'm here, I'm struggling with this, I'm trying to do the right thing, but it's hard. Nobody knows what I'm going through. Nobody understands. Yes, somebody does. And his name is Jesus Christ. And he says to these Christian programmers, don't you think there was Christians there that were just wishing they lived somewhere else? Oh, if we could just move to Jerusalem, to Bethlehem, where Jesus was born. Wouldn't that be awesome? You notice what Jesus doesn't say. He doesn't say, you guys are living in one of the most sinful places on earth. You need to move. He doesn't say, you're living in one of the most sinful places on earth. You need to withdraw. No. No. But what do we Christians often want to do? We want to, don't we? You know, it's, it's tough here. It's hard here. I don't like it here. Uh, so I'm going to move. I'm going to move to the suburbs where the people are nicer. I'm going to move to the Midwest where the people are nicer. I'm going to move to wherever where the people are nicer. But what would happen if all the Christians did that? If all the light were taken, there would be darkness. I think Jesus intentionally puts us in places where we can witness to non-believers. I hear people say, well, I wish I had a different job because at my workplace I am the only Christian there. Well, great. God's put you there for a reason. Be light in the darkness, you see. Be light in the darkness. Jesus is saying to you, just like he said to those in Pergamum, I know where you live. I know where you work. I know where you attend school. And I'm right there with you. Now they are struggling in this overtly idolatrous society. And, and it, was, it was pervasive. If you have uh, studied a little bit about the Jerusalem Council, which you can read about in the 15th chapter of Acts, there were, there were two things going on there, and that's where, where James and Paul and Peter and all of them came together, and they were going to try to settle an issue about what a Gentile had to do to be a, quote, good Christian. And uh, there were some Judaizers there, and they, their, their contention was, well, yes, you, you're saved by grace, but you also need to do this Jewish ritual or that Jewish ritual or whatever it was. So they, they did away with that right away. They just said, okay, they don't have to do anything. You're saved by grace alone. That's it. Okay? And they, they saw that one. But then they said, there are some things that we want you to abstain from. Now, if you go to most churches today, the list of things to abstain from can be very long, depending on the church and, you know, so on and so forth. But the list they came up with was very succinct. And all they, had, they said that they needed to abstain from was sexual impurity, idolatry, and engaging in the practice of idolatry. That's the abstaining from eating meat that's been offered to idols. That was it. The reason those are the things they addressed is because those are the things that were wiping the Christians out. Those were the things that were sucking them in and causing them all kinds of problems.
Notice again what Jesus does not say. He doesn't say move away from those things. He simply says remain faithful. He says, I know it's hard. But then he commends their faith. And he commends their faith even to the point of death. When he talks about Antipas. Now, Antipas, I would like to be able to tell you all kinds of interesting facts about him, but that's all we know. Just what you read there. That's all we know about him. But we know it gives us an, another window to look into the society that this church was forced to live amongst. That sometimes they'd tick people off so much that they'd kill them. Okay. Now, so far we don't have that kind of opposition. They may like to, but they don't. Okay. So we're still more or less law-abiding society. But in Pergamum, you could lose your life for remaining faithful to Jesus Christ. So Jesus commends their faith even to the point of death. And then he adds right at the end of the verse again what? Where Satan dwells. Where Satan lives. So he knows the situation. Now he's going to address uh, some of these eternal, internal problems in verses 14 through 16. He says this. But I have a few things against you. You have some, and, and notice the word some, not all, you have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Remember those folks? We, we met some of them uh, before. Therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. These people, the sum that he's talking about, are a living example of what we call indiscriminate tolerance, which is at the opposite end of intolerant tolerance. Okay? Indiscriminate tolerance is we tolerate anything and everything in the name of love. And so we just love everybody and anything is okay, whatever. Now, you need to understand He's not talking about those outside the church here. He's talking about those inside the church. Okay? Now you can go outside the church and you love those people. You're supposed to love those people. And you're supposed to tell them about Christ. You don't need to tell them to change their ways. Just point them to Jesus and he'll take care of working on them. The Spirit will do that. But within the church, we are not supposed to tolerate that kind of behavior. And what's happening in Pergamum is they are taller. Remember the, the, the Nicolaitans? We kind of looked at them and they were people that grew up within the congregation and were, were beginning to cause problems for the people and, and that sort of thing. So he says here something that's very interesting. This indiscriminate tolerance tolerates the teaching of Balaam and Balak. Now you remember the story of Balaam and Balak? probably do, you just don't know you do. It's in Numbers chapter 22, 4, 5, 22, 3, 4, and 5. And you all remember the, the, the story of the donkey, the talking donkey? You remember? Okay. Okay. That's Balaam and his donkey. You've heard that story probably. Well, that's not the best thing to remember in that story, but that's what all stands out to everybody. But here's the situation. So what was the sin of Balaam and Balak, or Balaam and Balak, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Well, here was the deal. The, the Israelites are in the wilderness, they're trekking along, they're on their way, they've had two or three encounters with other people groups, and they just did a number on them. You know, walked right through them. And now they're coming to Moab, where Balaam is the king. And he's heard about them coming, and he's heard how they just did away with these other groups in short order. So he wants protection. So he goes and sends his people to this prophet by the name of Balaam. And he says to him, I want you to come and I'm going to pay you a nice sum of money and I want you to pronounce curses on Israel. Well, fine. 
So he's on his way, and of course that's where the donkey story shows up. And God tells him, when the angel with the sword, you know, is standing there, and he says, I want you to go ahead and go, but I want you to say only that which I tell you to say. Okay, he says, and what else are you going to say? You got an angel standing there with a sword, you're going to say no? Yeah. So, so he says, okay. So he gets there to Moab, and he goes up to pronounce this curse on Israel, and instead of saying curses on Israel, he says blessings on Israel. Which didn't really make the king real happy. He says, what are you doing? I wanted you to curse those people and hear your blessing. And he says, well, God says that's what I have to say, so that's what I have to say. Okay. So that's not going to work. So, Balak says, what can I do? These people will destroy me. Here it is. Balaam says, listen, you can't fight these people. God's on their side. You can't destroy them from without. But here's what you do. You can read about this there in Numbers. You have your young ladies go and marry their young men. And you have them then sway these young men to just try, just try the idols just a little bit. And in a few years, you will destroy them from within. And sure enough, that's what happened. And so that's what's happening in Pergamum. These folks within the church that they're tolerating are then proselytizing the other Christians, just like the Nicolaitans did. And they're getting them to try this. It's okay. Just try it. Just a little bit. Feels really good. It's really awesome. We're free anyway. We're saved by grace. We can't lose our salvation. It doesn't matter. And little by little, they begin to devour themselves. This was true then. It's true now. And it will always be true. Okay. Now, it's interesting that it's always the same things, too. It's always sex and idol worship. That's what always gets them. Now, whenever you, you, you talk about this sort of thing, you have to throw in there because people always take it where you don't want it to go. There's nothing wrong with sex. It's fantastic. Okay? God created it. But here's the deal. You remember Pastor Darrell's little saying, Whatever potential a thing has for good, misused, it has the same potential for evil. See? And you will find that true across the board. Yeah, take something like uh, drugs. Wonderful thing. A wonderful thing. If you've lived as long as I have and some of the rest of you here, you can remember when almost every kid on the block had polio. Uh, you can remember what it was like when penicillin wasn't readily available. And drugs were, came along and it's, it's huge, it's made life so much better. But when they're misused, what happens? The wonderful thing becomes a terrible thing, a horrendous thing, it destroys lives. It's the same with sex. Used in the context God intended it to be, it's marvelous, wonderful. But it's the, one of the strongest drives we have that God has put in us. So misused, it's terrible. And it destroys lives. It destroys families, destroys churches, destroys individuals. So, it shouldn't surprise us that what would be one of the key things that Satan uses to destroy us. Remember now, key word in verses 14 and 15 is some. Not all, but some. What we see next is one of the most beautiful things about Jesus. And that's in verse 16. He, whoops, 16, therefore repent. Therefore repent. Sometimes we see that phrase as, oh shoot, now I got to do something I don't want to do. No, that's not the point at all. Jesus' first desire is always for our restoration. Always. So the first thing he says to the tolerant Christians in Pergamon, repent. Turn around. Get yourself back in line 
with my word. And that's a wonderful thing. And God graciously forgives and restores. However, willful disobedience also always comes with a cost, and sometimes a terrible cost. Because you read on, if not, I will come to you soon with the sword of my mouth. Wow. Don't want that. Tell you what, here is a warning for the entire church. I'll only put up with so much, and then I will act. <laughs> Now, you never want to be the one to try to label when and when it is not God's hand of judgment on a person's life, unless it's your own. Okay? But just think about it. How many calamities, how much tragedy could Christians avoid in their lives if they just kept themselves aligned with God? I don't know. But I think it's worth thinking about. Okay? So here's the warning to the church. He's saying, change your ways. Be faithful to me. Be faithful to my word. But if you do, now Jesus doesn't say this, but this is the truth. If you do, if you are, beware, because you will be branded with that word that society just doesn't like today. You will be called intolerant. But you know what? There are some things we shouldn't tolerate. It's just that simple. Okay. Now again, that's inside the church. Okay. Don't go outside the church and try to make non-Christians act like Christians ought to act. You won't have any success. Outside the church, you tell them Jesus Christ died for your sins. And you need a Savior. That's all you tell them. You don't say, change from being homosexual to being straight and then ask Jesus to be your Savior. No. You don't say, quit doing drugs and then ask Jesus to be your Savior. No. You say, you need a Savior. And then the Holy Spirit will take care of all that other stuff. But the problem is, you see, we're stuck in this thing that we look on the outside. All of us do. And so we look on the outside and we think, well, we've got to change these people. They've got to change on the outside before we can call them Christians. And that's not true, but it's hard for us. It's hard for me, because that's all I can see is the outside. But God looks on the inside. And we need to continually be trying to train ourselves to understand that. So what's the end of this thing? Well, as with all the other churches we've looked at, and we'll look at, there is a great reward. And here's that phrase that we, we see in each one. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Well, what Jesus is saying there, he's saying, listen up, pay attention and act. Now, we end up with some real mystery here. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on that stone. No one knows except the one who receives it. Now, in, in a lot of series on Revelation, we would seek to identify all of these things. What does the hidden manna mean? What does the white stone mean? What does the name mean? Well, and we, can, we could come up with all sorts of conjecture. Bottom line is, we don't know. We don't know what all those things mean. But, we do know a couple of things. We will be rewarded for our faithfulness in the body. That we know. And notice it says, to the one who conquers. Well, to the one who conquers whom? tell you what I think he's saying to the one who conquers himself to the one who is able to say to himself I want to bring my life in line with God's word you know Paul talks about not letting ourselves be ruled by anything 
So if you can conquer yourself, if you can keep yourself in line with what God has revealed to you, then you are an overcomer. Then you will take part in the hidden manna, which may be the great wedding feast. Don't know for sure. You will get the white stone. One thing uh, white stones were used for in those days, they were like tickets. They would get you into an event. Maybe that's going to get us into that great event we call the marriage supper of the Lamb. We'll rejoice with Jesus Christ forever and ever. And what's this whole name thing? He's going to give to them a name that only he knows. I think that's an intimate relationship. I mean, you think about it. Uh, people that don't know you at all will usually call you Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so. People that know you a little better will call you John or Mary or whatever your name is. But the people you are intimate with, your wife, maybe your children, they might have some pet name for you. The more intimate you are in a relationship, the more apt you are to have a special name. And I think what Jesus is trying to reveal to us here is, there's going to come a day when we are so intimately in relationship with him, that we will be on that kind of a basis with him. It's a marvelous thing. Marvelous thing to contemplate. And it's cool to know that he knows our situation. And all he asks us to do is conquer ourselves and remain faithful. How appropriate that we will have communion this morning. We talked about entrance into the great banquet in the sky, and this is a little precursor of it. Uh, so if uh, I'll ask, ask the Lord's blessing on it, and the men can come up, and we'll pass out the elements. Please keep them until everybody's been served and then we will take communion together. Father, thank you for your love for us. Thank you, Lord, that you are the first and the last, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, all of those things. And thank you, Lord, that you know where we are right here in Parkside Church. You know our needs. You know our flaws, our failings. You know everything about us and yet you love us anyway. And now you ask us to do a few things to make sure that our doctrine is as accurate as it can be, to make sure that we are loving one another, to make sure that we are dealing with one another in love when that is a, a necessary thing. And so, Lord, we ask you to bless this communion table. In Jesus' name, amen.